Today, among the 66 books of the Bible, let us study God's teachings with the sermon titled Those Who Live According to the Prophecies. Through this sermon, we are going to understand what kind of life God wants us to live in accordance with the prophecies. God said, What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. According to this verse, all the prophecies spoken by God are fulfilled in the way they are given. Therefore, we, the heavenly children, must live according to the prophecies. Let us see God's teaching in Matthew chapter 26, verse 54. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? While Jesus was being arrested by the soldiers and servants of the high priests, Peter drew out his sword, saying to them, I will not let you do that to my Lord, and tried to protect Jesus. In this situation, Jesus said to him, How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Jesus taught Peter that all things happen just the way they are written in the Bible because they are prophesied and that all prophecies must be fulfilled. Jesus said to Peter, God recorded prophecies in the Bible. If what has been prophesied is not fulfilled, how can you say that it is the Word of God? Prophecies must be fulfilled just as they are. It is not because I am powerless to drive them away, but because this is the life that has been prophesied for me to live. This is why I have to be arrested. These are the words of instruction that Jesus gave Peter at that very moment. Jesus meant, Peter, in the Bible it is prophesied, he was led silently like a lamb to the slaughter. If I punish them and drive them away in order not to be arrested by them, how can this prophecy be fulfilled? If I'm not taken by them, who will atone for the sins of mankind? Like this, Jesus taught us that the Bible consists of prophecies and that all the prophecies of the Bible must be fulfilled. Whose words are written in the 66 books of the Bible? God's words. What I have said, what will God do? Will I bring about? What I have planned, what will God do? That will I do. From now on, let us take a look at some scenes in the Bible and carefully discern how the Bible speaks about our future so that we can live a life of faith that is in accordance with God's will. Let's see John, chapter 19, verse 32. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first men who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now let's take a brief look at how this scene was already prophesied through the prophet Isaiah 700 years before Jesus was crucified. Let's see Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. In chapter 53, verse 5, it is written, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. How was the prophecy that was recorded 700 years before Jesus suffered fulfilled? 
it was fulfilled exactly the way it was prophesied. It is written in John chapter 19, verse 32, that the soldiers broke the legs of the robbers on both sides of Jesus. However, when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they pierced Jesus' side with a spear. They didn't have to pierce Jesus' side, did they? Don't you agree? Nobody asked the Roman soldiers to pierce Jesus' side. However, all these things were already prophesied 700 years before they happened, and Jesus fulfilled them. God already prophesied in the Bible that Christ would take up all the iniquities of mankind on the cross. It is not that Jesus and the soldiers agreed to do that because they read the prophecy. How would it be possible for Jesus and the soldiers to agree to do that after Jesus died on the cross? It was because God had spoken through the prophet 700 years before these events took place. He will surely be pierced for our transgressions. He will be whipped. He will be despised. He will not be esteemed. Jesus' life unfolded exactly the way it had been prophesied. Jesus did not ask to live a life like this, full of suffering. The founding religion in the nation of Israel treated Jesus with all the conditions that were foretold about 700 years ago. Let's see Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5, once again. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. It was prophesied that he would be whipped. Weren't there other ways that he could have been punished? However, the prophet Isaiah received God's revelation and even saw the situation that would take place 700 years later. According to Isaiah chapter 46, what does God see from the beginning? He even sees the end. That's why God had a prophet write what would take place in the future. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, it was not only prophesied that Jesus would be pierced with a spear, but he would also be whipped. This situation occurred so we could be healed. Let's see the fulfillment in Matthew chapter 27. In chapter 27, verse 25, it is written, All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But what did he do to him? He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Seeing how Christ would suffer on the cross for our sins, the prophet Isaiah wrote, He was whipped so we could be healed 700 years before it took place. Regarding the fact that Jesus took up our iniquities, God let the prophet describe precisely what kind of life Jesus would live 700 years before he came to the earth. Not only did God prophesy what kind of life Jesus would live, but he also recorded the matter of Jesus' death in perfect detail. Let's continue with Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. Chapter 27, verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. According to these words, where did they place Jesus' body? They placed his body in the tomb of a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph. His body was placed in the tomb of a rich man named Joseph from Arimathea. Where was this already prophesied? It is easy to consider all the things that happened to Christ as something ordinary. 
However, all these things were prophesied in the Bible. Let's see how it is prophesied by turning to Isaiah chapter 53. Let's see verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. And with whom in his death? The rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. A rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, had prepared a tomb for himself to use after he died. However, he placed Jesus' body there. All these events that happened to Jesus seemed like ordinary things that could occur at any time. However, everything happened exactly the way God had prophesied, through the Bible and the prophets. Everyone, when we look at these scenes one by one, what do you think about prophecies? Can we change the prophecies at our own discretion? No, we can never change the prophecies as we please. Prophecies will surely be fulfilled. It is because they are the words of God. God said, what I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. What God said is a prophecy. And what God has planned is also a prophecy. Therefore, as the heavenly children of God, what should we do? We should live according to the prophecies, which will bring about prosperous results of the gospel. There is also a prophecy that we should consider in the history of the Old Testament. Let's take a look at it in Genesis chapter 41. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 1, it is written, When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy, full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning his mind was troubled. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. So he called Joseph, who was Jacob's son, and had him interpret his dream. Let's read verse 16. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In my dreams, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but no one could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. What he said was, Your dream about the cows 
and your dream about the grains have the same meaning. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. Verse 27, the seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. There were seven years of unprecedented abundance in the land of Egypt, just as Joseph had interpreted. For seven years they had an abundance. However, from the year after the seventh year of abundance, they had seven years of unprecedented famine. This record in the Bible also shows us that God prophesied to one man about what would take place in the future. And he fulfilled everything exactly the way it was prophesied. We are looking at a prophecy and its fulfillment through what happened in the past. But the more important matter is what will happen to us. How is our future prophesied? Everyone, aren't you curious about our future? You can find all the answers for our future in the Bible. Every time we see the prophecies about our future, we receive strength and become extremely happy and full of hope. We think this is what is going to happen to us in the future. We are prophesied to enter the everlasting kingdom of heaven. Joseph said, if you fail to make proper preparations during the seven years of abundance, the country will be ruined during the seven years of famine. So make preparations during the seven years of abundance. When Joseph made such a wise suggestion to Pharaoh, what did he say? You are a perfect fit for this task. I give you full authority. I appoint you as second in command. Like this, Joseph was appointed as governor to oversee all the issues throughout Egypt on behalf of Pharaoh, wasn't he? During the years of abundance, Joseph had storehouses built throughout the country and stored food there. He did this work diligently for seven years, and on the eighth year, the famine began. Things happened exactly the way God had prophesied. As a severe famine struck the land of Egypt, people had to pay double or triple the amount to buy food. Some people were even forced to sell their land in order to purchase food. However, Pharaoh's fortune grew abundantly. All of this is written in the Bible. Then, by looking at this example, shouldn't we also make preparations since we already know what is going to happen through the prophecies? In the book of Revelation, God said, I will repay each of you according to your deeds. This too is a prophecy. Even though we want to receive many awards in heaven, if our actions deserve only a little, then we will receive only a few awards. 
It is because God said, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Joseph made preparations because he absolutely believed that the seven years of abundance and the seven years of famine would come. Then shouldn't we also make preparations for the kingdom of heaven which is drawing near? We must not be the foolish ones who give up abundant blessings just because our present lives are a little tiring and difficult. Since we know that the glory to come is so great, shouldn't we endure patiently? For seven years, Joseph bought all the grain throughout the country. As the abundance of grain continued for seven years, the farmers sold their harvest and did not think ahead. On the eighth year, the year after the seven years of abundance, famine struck the land and lasted for seven years. Everything happened just as God had prophesied through Joseph. This is no different in comparison to what will happen to us. Prophecies will surely be fulfilled whether people believe and live according to them or people despise them. We've had abundance for seven years, so I'm sure we will have abundance in the eighth year too. There must have been people who thought like this in the time of Joseph. As they saw overflowing grain and abundant crops for seven years, they could not believe no matter what prophecies of God were given to them. In the eighth year, they thought, I don't think there will be a famine. In the ninth year, they thought, I'm sure we will have abundance this year. But the famine continued. The seven years of abundance were followed by seven years of famine, according to the prophecy. Those who believed in the prophecy could prepare for the seven-year famine. But those who did not believe the prophecy could never prepare for the famine. Likewise, we must keep in pace with the prophecy promised by God in today's life as we think about the eternal glory of heaven that will come to us in the future. We cannot help but read Revelation chapter 22 in order to keep in step with the prophecy. Let us take a look. In verse 5 it is written, There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will do what? Reign forever and ever. Verse 6 says, The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy. And what are they? True. The angel clearly said, These are God's true words of prophecy and promises of prophecy that contain no lies. Therefore, these words are trustworthy and true. Seeing this prophecy, we should see the glorious world which God has prepared for us and live according to this prophecy. Instead of worrying, what will I do tomorrow? What will become of me? Let us also look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. Verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are, What are they? Trustworthy and true. Those who live according to the prophecies have hope for this kind of future. We must never give up or lose this glorious world because our hearts are taken away by a life that will disappear in a moment. Would Joseph have built storehouses if he had not absolutely believed that the seven years of famine would come after the seven years of abundance as God showed Pharaoh in his dream? He would never have done that. 
And would he have bought grain during the abundance which lasted for seven years? The grain would have gone bad if there had been abundance in the eighth, ninth, or tenth year. However, he could do this because he absolutely believed the prophecy. In the same way, all the prophecies God has shown us today, including Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22, apply to those who believe them, but those who do not believe cannot live according to the prophecies. If someone says, the reality of now is more important, how can I believe that I will go to that glorious place and reign forever? He is like the person who thought that although the seventh year would end, there would be an abundant harvest in the eighth and ninth year as well. People who depended on their own point of view, thinking that God's prophecy would not be fulfilled, must have suffered tremendously from the eighth year. Isn't this true? We are God's children. We believe that God surely fulfills His words. All the words written in the 66 books of the Bible are God's words. They are God's words and prophecies. God said, in the glorious world where there is no more death or mourning or sorrow or sickness or pain or aging, you will have eternal life and blessings forever. Everyone, does this sound vague? God's words are not just some vague stories of dreamers. They are precise prophecies. I hope that we will aim our future in the direction of that glorious world and live our lives in step with the prophecies. By this, I would like to conclude today's sermon. Thank you very much.